introduce myself and say hello and thank you, sir. Can you see? <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Okay. Are we ready? We're good. We're go. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alex Collier. I want to thank you all very much for coming. This is a very, very special treat for me. I love these small, intimate settings here, these living room type of things, um, because I'm I'm very comfortable and when I'm definitely in my element, I like to talk. Okay, and I'm definitely in the mood for a talk fest, as they used to say. Um, the information that I shared this morning, I'm going to go over again briefly because I went through it so quickly and some of you weren't there. Uh, but essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about the 22 races. And the book that will be ready this spring is going to be called Defending Sacred Ground 2 ET22. Okay? I've been wanting to do this, this book for 10 years and now it's time to do it. Um, and the reason it's time is that there's so much going on in our solar system that we all need a scorecard. And I just hope to be able to uh, share the knowledge that's been shared with me as to who these beings are um, and how they relate specifically to Earth, to us. In a nutshell, we are a composite of a lot of different races, 22 to be exact. It is a physiological fact that there are 22 different body types on the planet. Um, and that is the result of the extraterrestrial races. I cannot share everything that I have in two hours because I am sharing the stage tonight with Mike Russ. But I will be around, okay? I'm definitely going to be available. And the information uh, in, the, in the every couple of weeks, you check the website, the information is going to be put on the website. Okay, so you will have it as soon as it's done and it's proofed and edited. All right? Um, there will be a hardcover or a bound book version of that, but by then you will already have the information. If it's something that you wanted to purchase at that point to give to friends, it will be available. Okay, but it will be for free nonetheless. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into how it all started for me. Uh, for 13 years I've been telling that story and I refuse to tell that story anymore. Okay, if you want to know, you can go to the website www.lettersfromandromeda.com and all the information is there including book one which you can download for free. I'm doing that for the video pretty much. Okay, now Earth history, we are taught a very, very shallow version of Earth history. Uh, we are also taught that we evolved from a single cell, that essentially we were an accident. Okay, all of us are just an accident. And something happened, something really weird, but yet something miraculous happened to a couple of chimpanzees, and ta-da, here we are. Okay? Should it be so simple? In fact, I like the, the real version much better <laughs> than the concocted version. Okay? Um, and so what we're going to talk about, what I'm going to start with is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with some of the Earth-taught timelines of history, and I'm going to um, blow through specific periods and just move it through to prove a point. This will be much more specific um, in the book, okay? Earth formation. We're going to start with a Precambrian time, 4.5 billion years ago to 554 million years ago. Earth taught history. The Earth is forming along with other planets in the solar system. Earth is being born. Life is awakening. The first tectonic plates are beginning to move. Fungus, plants, animals, and organisms are developing, and the atmosphere is becoming enriched with oxygen. Okay. Extraterrestrial taught history, or I should say Andromedan taught history. An ancient race known as the Founders 
who the, Plei who the um, Andromedans and the Pleiadians believe is an ancient race called the Patal. That's P-A-A-T-A-L. Is on an engineering program whereby environments of planets and terraforming is being done. They are um, doing this to make make these planets and, and star solar systems suitable and habitable for organisms and for life. Rendering ecosystems that are filled with hydrogen, oxygen, methane, and ammonia. Okay, now take a look at ecosystems, one being oxygen, or some being oxygen, some being methane, some being ammonia, and some being hydrogen. Now these are all gases. <clears throat> For the introduction and colonization of microorganisms, nanites, and all types of life forms. Self-replicating machinery and the bombardment by comets and planetoids to change the rotation and the chemistry of the planets. We'll get to the self-replicating machinery here in a little bit. The practice and engineering of removing moons to alter a planet's rotation and moving planets closer and further from their suns to either decrease or increase radiation received by the planets. Now I want you to know that that specific engineering feat of moving planets closer and further away from the sun, moving moons, adding moons, is a practice that is absolutely in full swing today throughout the galaxy and in other galaxies. Okay? It is, it is solar system building. This happens a lot. There are races, even the Andromedans, are capable of creating a solar system. Okay? <clears throat> All projects, it, it appears, were designed to render many star systems and many planetary bodies habitable for organic life. Small machines have been discovered that were built so long ago that no one really knows for sure who built them. They cannot be replicated and no one knows exactly how they were built. Now, I'll give you an example of the Andromedans. The Andromedans are approximately 45, 43 to 4500 years more advanced than we are technologically. Now that's in our years, all right? Now in our years, in our years here, I need more leash. <laughs> okay, a year for us equals 365 days. Okay, this is one rotation around our sun. The Andromedans count years in a completely different way. In fact, almost all the extraterrestrials do. And their, their concept of age, of counting, especially in this way, what they consider a year is when every cell in their body has been fully duplicated, replicated. Now, if we did that, one year would be equal to seven years in our body. Okay, so it takes approximately 34 years for their bodies in our time to replicate every cell in their body in our time. Okay? So it's hard to give you exact dates of when they say something happened to, 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 to put it into our, our timeline okay, of, of years. Okay? Because in reality, if I say it, it was 4,000 years ago, then it, it, it's, it's a lot longer than that. Okay? But they've had a very hard time explaining to me exactly in our Earth time because they don't deal with the concept of time. You know? They just don't. All right?
So, but I'm giving you these numbers in Earth years just to give you an idea of how vast our history is, okay? <clears throat> now, amazingly, these machines still work. The machines do not have a name in the English language, okay? They don't even have a symbol that we could comprehend. So it's been explained to me that it is considered an antimatter machine. Okay? It creates matter. It creates molecules, which then create atoms, which then creates physicality. And these are actual machines. They're like computers, where you can program it for what you want, and this machine will literally bring it forth and manifest it. And there it is, physically there. Okay? Now, if each one of us had one of these machines, it would be like winning the lottery every day. You know? Mike likes to do VWs. He could make himself a new VW as soon as the new models came out. As soon as he knew what he wanted. <laughs> okay? I could, manif I could create a, a babysitter. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that my wife and I could go out. <laughs> Okay, it, 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 and then that's what's, that's what, now, uh, apparently there are seven of these actually working and seven different races have them, have one of these machines. Now, these are archaeological finds, discoveries, these atom-making machines, you know what for lack of a better word. Is that on the I'm, planet? I'm sorry? Is that on the there is one on the planet. There is one here. Yes, there is. What? Is that the one on the No comment. No comment. Do you know where they were found? Nobody knows. Absolutely nobody knows. It turns out that, well, let me just finish reading here, okay? Because all this will come out. <clears throat> um, they also discovered advanced building complexes, very large machinery, and, and complete terraforming ecosystems. Earth-like organic life is much less common than hydrogen gas ecosystems in our galaxy because we are limited, uh, oxygen O2 ecosystems are limited to the geological presence of water. Okay, for O2 life forms, which is what everything is on this planet, there has to be water. So, the most precious thing that we have is our ecosystem, our biosphere. The second most important precious thing we have is, of course, the water. And when we get to Nibiru, I'm just going to throw this out there, the entire planet used to be fresh water. Okay? Our entire planet used to be fresh water. The oceans were salinated. Okay, and it was the Nibiru from the star system of Butes that did that because they wanted to control the water. Okay? They salted the sea. They salted the sea. That's right. So now all you have is, at the time when they did this, there was only 4% fresh water, and they had total control over it. That's correct. What was the years again? That they did this? Uh, it took it took 36, 30, it took 36 years, 36 years to completely salinate the oceans, and it also gave time for all the life forms in the water to adapt very slowly. But we couldn't drink the water after that. Okay. Is that 36 of our years? Of our years. These are all in our years. Okay. It's the only way I'm going to present this to you. Otherwise, it'll get way too confusing. Okay? okay? So, um, hydrogen ecosystems are much more abundant as are methane and because they are not complicated ecosystems. O2 ecosystems are very, very complex. The most complex in the galaxy.
Archaeological evidence, records, and legends point to the founders, quote unquote, the Patal, as the creators and caretakers of this galaxy. The disappearance and or extinction of the founders appears to be deliberate. And what that means is, and what, how it's been explained to me, when they use, you, we all know what disappearance means, but to the Andromedans, when they refer to extinction, if there is no physical record of them on third density, they're extinct on third density. That doesn't mean that they're, they're gone. It could be that they evolved or ascended to a higher frequency, or they dropped down to a higher frequency to create third density, and when they were done, they left. But they are extinct on third density. Okay? See, in sharing this information, <laughs> this particular information that I'll be sharing in the next year, it's important to, to stretch yourselves to try to think holographically here, okay? Because there are so many implications to this information, and, and, it's, and it's, difficult to heart, to, it's difficult to try to express that because the English language is so limiting, you know, to try to give you a concept about how this was all done. Um, when the Patal apparently left, according to the archaeological record, other life forms, sentient life forms, reptilian, human, plasmic, methane life forms, all begin to appear and do appear in our galaxy in full form. Okay, now just think about that. They appear in full form. That means that they came from someplace else or they were brought from someplace else. There was no millions and millions of years worth of evolution into this, okay? And this is the same problem that our archaeologists have on planet Earth, okay? They, you know, they keep espousing evolution, but there's just no proof of the evolution in the geological, archaeological record. There just isn't. Things appear fully formed, okay? It's amazing stuff. Now, are the Patal archangels, are the Patal the gods? Nobody knows what they are, which is why they just refer to them as the founders, because they don't know. Okay? They don't know. Um, the Andromedans do say that there is a creation, creator. They, in their belief systems in their traditions say that um, it does not carry a dominant male frequency. In their opinion, it carries a dominant female frequency. Okay? So, in their opinion, and I'm telling you, they're real men. <laughs> you know, the, the creator is a goddess. Okay? Does exist. Okay, so we blew through that. The Paleozoic era, 554 million years ago to 245 million years ago. A dramatic explosion of diverse multi-celled animals. Well, they put that because suddenly everything is there. It's, it's in the geological record. They don't know how it got there, where it came from, but it's there. So they just say, well, it just exploded. There it is. The, all these different things show up out of nowhere. Species appear with all living animals, almost all living animals, and species appear within a few million years. Again, there's no evolutionary process here. They just begin to see them in the archaeological record. And each consisting on different parts of our modern, modern continents. Now, at the time that this was happening, the North and South Pole were different. Okay? They were, the air planet was literally laying on its side. It had already had a pole shift, one of its many pole shifts. Okay, which is where the physical north and south pole rotate, usually following um, a magnetic pole shift if it's done on its own. If it doesn't do it on its own, that is because a planetoid or an asteroid hit the planet, made it roll, and then what happens is, is the magnetic poles will either correct it 
over, over time and make the planet rotate back or the magnetic poles will follow. Okay? I do not understand um, the mechanics of that. The west coast of North, North America ran east and west along the equator. Africa was the South Pole. Okay. Suddenly, during this period, 245 million years ago, 90% of all marine and animal life becomes extinct. Okay. Animal life. Not plant and fauna. Okay. Marine and animal life. Now, you would think that if something really dramatic happened, that everything would be affected. But that's not what happened. Okay? It was mammal and animal life. Okay. The same period, 544 million to 245 million. The ET history, the Andromedan ET history. Races in the solar system begin to develop space travel. Most are only able to travel within their own star systems. Some, however, are able to travel outside of their respective systems and have begun contact and discovery of other cultures. The start of trade within star systems begins. Trade routes are established and negotiated. The sharing of technology has begun and the development of new systems of space travel has also begun because now the space colonies, the different races that have been established here that came in and fully formed have now figured out how to get off their own planets and now they're talking to other people getting different perspectives and they're sharing ideas okay, and sharing opinions. Um, I've not touched on this and I won't touch on it in this lecture um, but there were also a lot of misunderstandings okay, that went on here especially between the hydrogen planets in cultures and the O2 cultures. And I'll explain why there were some different misunderstandings later on when we get into this. Okay, uh, treaties were forged between star systems and races. One particular race of sentient beings, which, which was much more advanced in space travel, set out to explore the galaxy. That is the Alpha Draconans, the sea car. They were the very first according to the Andromedans, to actually get off planet. And they were, at the time, the most advanced. Okay? They're an incredible race. They are, they are an incredible race. They just have some incredibly ridiculous prejudices and biases. Okay? But that doesn't take, an, take anything away from the fact that as a culture, they've done some incredible things, you know? And a lot of other races have learned from them as well. Their spacecraft, at the time, were hollowed out moons and planetoids, which they refurbished, built out, created their own internal ecosystems, and fitted with propulsion. Some of that using fuel, which is not oil like we have here, but it was some kind of a gel that was mined in their star system. And kinetic engines. They created kinetic engines. What's kinetic? Energy. Focused energy. Electricity, a type of electricity. It's my understanding. Well, yeah. Which uh, let, let's hold the questions. Let's hold the questions, okay? I have a lot of material to go through. The Mesozoic era, which is 245 be million years ago to 65 million years ago. Uh, Robin, write down your question. Okay, please. I, I, okay, Earth taught history. Mesozoic means middle animals. It is the time during which the world's fauna changed drastically. Now, it didn't change before, but now suddenly it does and great change in terrestrial vegetation. The dinosaurs evolve, well, they show up out of nowhere, okay, and evolve in the Triassic and then Jurassic eras, only then to become extinct. Another planet-hitting asteroid hits the Earth in the Atlantic Ocean 
off the coast of Colombia, what is now known as Colombia. Now, were they deliberate? Uh, nobody seems to know if they were or not. But what's interesting is that every time the planet gets hit with an asteroid or, or there's a pole shift, there's a radical change in the Earth or its ecosystem. And what happens is it becomes more and more friendly for human life. Okay? 244 million years ago, we could not live on this planet. There were just too many things out there that would have hurt us. Okay? Extraterrestrial history, 245 million years ago to 65 million years ago. Many planetary civilizations have full space travel. Interplanetary trade is extremely established, and the need for natural resources increases and causes the exploration of the galaxy by advanced sentient beings. Space travel has been in progress and trade for over 17 million Earth years at this point. Okay? 17 million years. Look at what we have accomplished in 4,000 years. Okay? Look what we've accomplished in 4,000 years. Okay? And, and we know we've been held back, and we also know that there's technology that's been hidden from us. Okay? So, the most well-established star races are the sea car of Alpha Draconis, or, Dra or Draco, the Orion star civilizations, and the Lyra, Vega star system. Colonization is in full swing. Many planetary alliances set up rules of colonization and reach, are now reaching further and further out into the galaxy. So here, 245 million years ago, our star brothers, okay, our ancestors, because they are, because we're the sum total of 22 of these races, our ancestors already had space travel and they were already setting up rules of colonization amongst themselves. Okay? That's just amazing to me. The discovery of space highways. Space highways are what our scientists theorize to exist as wormholes. Okay? They're space highways. The discovery of these is made at, during this period. To date, 17 have been discovered in our galaxy alone. 17 wormholes. Okay, and for those who don't know what we're talking about, um, this is our galaxy, the little dots of the stars, and what you have are tunnels that go to different parts of the galaxy. Just to give you a little example. And it's believed, or our scientists theorize, that if you can tap into one, you're on the other end of the galaxy in almost no time, in a blink. Or like the movie Stargate. Okay? That's the idea. Several of these connect to other galaxies. Okay, so, and we all have to assume that at least one of those connecting tunnels would be to the Andromedan galaxy, okay, which is over here. So, you've got a hole, you've got a hole here. Okay, now you have a way to get there in like zero time or incredibly fast so that it's not a situation where you get in your rocket and by the time you get to your destination, everybody's dead because of old age and, and, and everything else. Okay? Because the galaxy is huge and it's expanding all the time. Okay. But as the galaxy expanded, many of these tubes of focused time, that's the Andromedan perspective of what a wormhole is. 
tubes of focused time. I cannot explain it to you any more than that. Okay? Because I do have some notes that are still stored away in a storage unit in another state where they have had to be put for safety and I've not gotten them yet. Okay? In fact, there's three boxes of notes. It does not even go there. Okay? <clears throat> um, these seven... Um, I'm sorry. Some of these tubes have, ex have snapped. In other words, as the galaxy expanded, okay, there were breakages in these wormholes or space highways. <clears throat> no galactic races to the present time, and this is as of 11 months ago, Earth time. Okay. Knew how they were built, or who they built them, or who built them, and they can't be repaired because we don't know how they were built. Nobody knows how they were built. Okay, there is an assumption by many that the founders created them, which is how they were able to do all of the terraforming and echo building in the galaxy, in in preparation for life to be introduced here. There is an assumption that that's who built it. The truth is, we don't really know for sure. It could have been built by someone even before them. We don't know. Okay? Because according to the Andromedans, third density as we know it is 21 billion years old. Okay? The universe that we know of, which includes all the dimensions, is is 21 trillion years old in Earth years, okay? Which is a staggering number, absolute staggering number. Okay, we're going to get to some slides here in just a little bit. Okay. Um, according to, to Moranay and the Andromedans, only two of the superhighways, the wormholes, have not snapped in our galaxy. Okay. So out of the 17, two are still fully operational. As trade increases, in, increased, the spread of life forms also takes place. The experimentation of transplanting life forms and vegetation is in full swing. Okay, now let's go back to the dates. 245 million to 65 million years ago. Our extraterrestrial ancestors are now transplanting vegetation and life forms from other systems to other star systems. Okay? The transplanting of life forms is only with life that has potential. Now what their actual definition of that potential is, I can't tell you because I don't know. But according to Moranet, this potential can only develop in complex ecologies. And, the, and by far the most complex ecology or ecosystem in the galaxy is O2, oxygen based, which is what we are. Truly complex ec ec ecosystems only occur in a relatively small number of planets in the galaxy. Now that might, you know, that might be, uh, you know, s several billion planets. But when you take in, you know, take into account, you know, how many suns and how many actual star systems we have, it is in fact a small amount. Even though to us, you know, we would say, my God, you know, there's, there's, uh, 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 you know. 200 billion Earths out there? I mean, that's a staggering number to us. But in the big scope of things, it's actually a very small amount because the hydrogen ecosystems by, out, by far outweigh all the others. Okay? <clears throat> it follows that a complex ecosystem, planet-wide ecosystem, is the next most valuable thing in the universe to consciousness. Species, however, come and go, 
but a truly rich biosphere will endure as long as it's not compromised. Dinosaurs, birds, and other life forms, fruit trees are brought to our solar system and transplanted on the three ecosystems in our, in our solar system. They are Earth, Mars, and Uranus. All developed extraterrestrial races have already impressed on their civilizations that conservation of biospheres was and is simply a necessity. Okay? This is 245 million to 65 million years ago. Okay? They were already teaching their children about conservation of the ecosphere, ecosystem. Okay. <clears throat> The Cenozoic era, 65 million years ago to present. Okay, we're going to get through this and then we're going to get really down into some fun stuff. Earth taught history, sometimes called the age of mammals, because the largest land, land animals and mammals show up during this time. It is also the age of flowering plants, the age of insects, the age of fish, and the age of birds. Okay? Andromedan taught history. Our solar system is being visited more and more. Three very complex ecosystems exist here already. Okay, we've already covered that. The first full time self contained biosphere called an Eden. And I'm going to use that word because. That's what the Orions called it. That's what the, the, well, the Draco have a different language, but that's what the Orions called it. That's what the Nibiru called it. That's what the Aldebarans called it. And that's what the Pleiadians call it, an Eden, okay? Which is like a garden. It's a fully transplantable biosphere, having everything they need to exist somewhere else, okay? Now, we do not really appreciate how smart our ancestors are, okay? Because they don't always travel in very large spacecraft. But what they have learned to do is travel light and make sure that whatever it is that they need, they have or they can grow. Now, virtually every mothership has an internal ecosphere. Every one. Now, we see the scout craft. We see the four, the five, the hundred miles craft. The hundred mile may have some kind of an ecosphere inside of it because it has a crew. That crew needs to eat. Okay, so they will create a park-like setting, an ecosphere, inside those spacecraft. Most of the craft that have hit the Earth are just little scout ships. Okay, um, if a hundred-mile mothership hit the Earth, we'd have a pole shift, and everybody would know about it. Okay, but the very large ships, and, uh, and I'll give you the example of the Andromedan motherships. They're complete spheres, and on the inside, they are complete worlds unto themselves. In the center of these crafts, and they may have as many as three, they will have ecosystems, park-like parks, as, as, as big as 21 miles long. The one that I saw was 21 miles from one end to the other. For me, and it was 900 miles, okay? And for me to literally see every inch of that ship would take 25 years. That's how big it was. Had everything. Everything. In these parks, you could not even tell that you were in a spacecraft. 
you would think you were you would think you were in a park you know uh, Agora Hills California Rocky Mountain National Park uh, Central Park although I wouldn't necessarily want to hang out there um, <laughs> you know Central Park but you know without the crime uh, okay and they're complete unto themselves everything is grown aboard the craft so when they come here and they send a team down to the surface of a planet and they say okay we're setting up a small uh, uh, we're setting up an Eden because we're gonna leave you a, a team of you here to research the life the plant life the geology of the planet the minerals what it has okay what they do is they literally drop can be as many as 12 type of cylindrical antennas they plant these antennas down into the ground at least a mile into the ground and when they flip these things on they connect and when they connect when they turn on and they connect to each other they create a dome okay a dome it's a frequency dome and then all they do is they unload the plants they unload the fruit trees everything they need and they in this biosphere is exactly to match their physiology doesn't have too much oxygen doesn't have too much carbon it's exactly what they need it can even be hydrogen it can even be hydrogen because what it means is is then once they leave they just wear a spacesuit and they can go out and do their work but when they come back from doing their work they enter their biosphere and it's like it's like living on the home planet okay this is what I'm talking about this is what an Eden is okay this is what Richard Hoagland's been talking about all those years with the dome structures. This is what he's talking about. This is what these things were for. Exactly. Okay? It's good stuff. God, it gives me the chills. <clears throat> okay. The very first one was founded in North America. Well, what is now North America. Okay? along what is now known as the New Mexico-Arizona border. And it was founded by and established by the CCAR, which are a hydrogen-based life form. Okay? So they had to have something like this. Now, hydrogen is a gas, okay? It's not something we can use. We can't, our physiology simply will not allow us to to breathe and, and, and live in an environment like that. But hydrogen, the beings tend to be very large. They tend to be a little bit slower in movement. Their body frequency, the rhythms of their biosystem are much, much slower than O2. And the one thing about hydrogen-based life forms is that they cannot go faster than the speed of light in space travel. They can't. Where O2 have been known to go four times the speed of light. Okay? And that's been a real problem for the hydrogen-based beings. Okay? In lectures years ago, I talked about how prejudice is an extraterrestrial perspective. That's what I've been taught by Moranane Faseus. Okay, so all the prejudices we have, we've learned. We've formed some of our own, okay? But the initial not liking any of your own race was taught to us by these guys, okay? Millions and millions of years ago. Okay, now, this first Eden was created 899 thousand seven hundred and one earth years ago okay and this was by the sea car in New Mexico Arizona border okay they still fancy the desert 
still fancy what? They still fancy the desert, the reptilians. Okay? <clears throat> this biosphere was first inhabited by caste. Now, the reptilian civilization is three castes, is, is a caste system. Okay, it's also, it's a monarchy, but it's also a caste system. And you will find that it is stunningly similar <laughs> to those in England, okay, in Europe, where you have royalty, okay? You have the officer class, which is your dukes, your earls, okay? And then you have your peasants who do all the dirty work, literally do all the work. Okay? It's exactly like that. According to Mornay, this first biosphere was built by the officer caste or officer class of reptilian beings, and they were the first to stay here. It was not actual royalty. Okay? Okay, everybody have this? Okay. Several thousand years later, <clears throat> Orion, well, actually a couple hundred years later, Orion established an Eden here from the Orion star system. Ah, I'm so bummed my wife is missing all this. Okay. If you have your cheat sheet that I handed you, huh? oh yes, I'm sorry. Good. Thank you, Mike. Okay, in Orion, they come from Rigel and Betelgeuse. Now, okay, that's these systems here. extra. Now, Rigel, the star we call Rigel, the Orions, their name for this planet, for this star system, is Cyclopesis. In their tongue, it is called Cyclopesis. And whenever they go to a formal function of a galactic event, where there are other star races there, and, and we'll talk about, we will get to that. Um, the, the proper way that they introduce themselves, and this is what the Andromedans do, and apparently it's tradition, and it was done, and everybody, everyone, whether they're enemies or not, have agreed to these specific introduction traditions so that there's no misunderstandings, okay? So they've created traditions, and everybody does it, no matter what. This is what they do. You introduce yourself, you give them your full name, any rank or office, and the star system that you're from. So, Alex Collier, father, because I don't have a rank or an office, okay? Um, Saul System Terra 3. That's how I would properly introduce myself. So that whoever it is that I'm introducing myself to knows who I am and where I'm from. Now, if you're an extraterrestrial, you're all talking, most of them are telepathic. So therefore, they're giving the same information, but as they're giving the information, they're also flashing star maps because that's what's in their head, you know? And the other races immediately acknowledge that because they, they get all that, okay? Okay, um, Orion established their first Eden in what is now called, I'm going to write this down for you, Yuramani, China. The date, 763,132 years ago. <clears throat> okay. Shortly thereafter, 
Capella, also part of Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. The Capellans established their first full operational Eden, 741,237,000 ,000 years ago. And theirs was excuse me, established at the base of Mount Yogan in southern Chile. Next are the Vegans. Now this is not a this is not <laughs> a plant eating race. I just want to explain that. Okay, they're from Vega. They're also known to us as the Lyrans, who are literally our human ancestors. Okay? They established their first colony seven hundred and one thousand six hundred and fifty five thousand years ago in North Africa along what is now known today as the Libyan and Niger border. Okay? And I want you to know that on an, on an archaeological um, perspective from what I've been told, there in Ethiopia, there are absolute amazing things yet to be dug up there that have been left behind that, you know, the cavemen did not build. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Next, we have the Cassiopeians. Cassiopeians, 604,000 and three years ago. This is an entirely insexual sentient race as Algeria, North Africa. And I'm just going to do two more, and then I'll just read the rest. Can we thank them for yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, the next is Boutes. Nibiru, we know them today. They established their first Eden 585,133 years ago in Cairo. What a shock, what a surprise. Okay, Cairo, Egypt. And then Orion sent another team here, 87,300 years ago. And this one was established in Perth, Australia. Now, the Earth was not in the position that it's laying in now, okay? If you were to take the planet as it is today and lay it literally on its side, this is where they were colonizing. But these are the locations we know today, okay? Now, some of the colonies, after they'd been here for some time, they packed up and they left. They got all the information they wanted, okay? But the Earth is in constant flux. You gotta remember these are high, many of these are hydrogen based extraterrestrial hydrogen based extraterrestrials, hydrogen breathing extraterrestrial races. So when they go to their home planet, it's dull compared to the very complex ecosystems that O2, that oxygen breathers have and live with. Okay, so they're extremely fascinated and you can and according to Morinet, what they were trying to do was to not only study the vegetation and life forms here in oxygen 
oxygen breathing ecosystems, but they were also trying to genetically manipulate them so that they could take them home and make them hydrogen. That's what a lot of this was about. Okay? This is where, you know, they became geneticists, master geneticists, is trying to convert O2 life forms to hydrogen life forms. Okay? Because we're blessed. Oxygen breathers are blessed with very complex ecosystems, very magnificent ecosystems. Okay. Lyrans again came back 83,400 years ago. Has everybody, anybody ever been to Basque country? To the Basque? Right. Their language, nobody knows their language, where it came from. It's, it's an ancient, it's an ancient Lyran tongue that has survived. It's extraterrestrial. In fact, all of them are. But that one is, is really, really still close to, a, to the original tongue. Okay. Orion came back again 73,414 years to Mount Neblina on the border of Venezuela and Brazil. Now, 71,933 BC, Lemuria is founded as a collective colony. Many of these races decide, okay, let's just pool our resources. And they move their Edens to a continent in the Pacific. Those nations were, those star nations were, the Lyrans, this is who founded Lemuria, Cirrus A, Pleiades, races from Tegeta and Miropa, specifically, those two star systems, Tegeta and Miropa. Ursa Minor, okay, this is the Lyran star system. You have your cheat sheet, okay, tells you where the races were from, okay. We're all fascinated, everybody's fascinated, well I'm not, but everybody's, a lot of people are fascinated with the Pleiadians. Okay, so we'll leave that up there because we're going to talk about them in a little bit. And Butes, which is Nibiru. This is 71,933 BC. Okay, Lemuria is established as a collective colony. So now everybody's working together. Okay? Good sign. That's a good sign. Okay? It didn't last, however. 57,600 B.C. Atlantis is founded. Now somewhere between the establishment of Lemuria and the establishment of Atlantis, the Pleiadians get pissed off and they leave. Okay? A misunderstanding. They come back. They come back to the star system. And Atlantis is founded 57,600 B.C. So the Pleiadians again, the Nibiru, Antarians, the Hades, a group from Sagittarius, and the Andromedans. Make a guest appearance. Ta -da. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Do I need to read those again? Yeah. Okay. Atlantis, Pleiadians, Andromedans, Butes, which is Nibiru. You know, but you might as well know where they're from. Aldebaran, Antarians, A N T A R I E A N S, the Hades, which is right here, and Sagittarians. With the exception of Nibiru, all of these are O2s, okay, that established Atlantis. 
O2 breathers, with the exception of Nibiru. Some of them of the Nibiruan tribe are oxygen breathers, okay, because they come from Cirrus, okay? But those that come from Butes are hydrogen. But they can still operate and function as long as they wear a, hel a helmet, okay? So, 31,017 BC, Lemuria is destroyed in war. The exact date is 31,017 BC. Twenty-seven thousand six hundred and three BC, Atlantis is destroyed. For which? Ad, okay, Atlanta, uh, Lemuria is thirty-one thousand seventeen BC, and Atlantis is twenty-seven thousand six hundred and three BC. Um, I'm adding BC. It was in my notes. I just didn't do it. I was very quick in running through my notes oh, this morning. You didn't mean BC. Yes, ma'am. That's what I meant. So I apologize for not no, being 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 more specific. Okay. Yes, I take full responsibility for that. Okay. Now, um, I'm not going to go into, you know, the who's and the what's and how's and why they destroyed each other. Um, but again, let's just kind of go to the cheat sheet here. Actually, let's not. Let's just do this. Let's do this. I'm going to, actually, I'm, I'm doing pretty well here on time. So, Let's talk about the races, okay? Let's talk about the sea car, Alpha Draconis, the ancestral line of the reptilian races in our galaxy. The reptilian, the sea car themselves, according to legend, do not know exactly where their home system is either. That's how big the gal the universe is, or the galaxies are. Okay, uh, the, the universe. Okay, that's how big it is. Um, according to the Andromedans, um, there are a hundred billion galaxies, known and mapped, in the known universe. <laughs> you know. Now, if we can get a 7-Eleven franchises in just every, one of those. <laughs> One of those in each galaxy we'd have it made, you know, or a coffee shop, even better, legally addictive stimulants. Let's just do that. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just going to give you some things about each of the races, or several of the races anyway, okay, because um, I want to take a break in just a little bit, and I want to finish up. I want to take some questions, and then Mikey's going to do some sharing. Uh, Mike Russ. Okay, the sea car. An absolute amazing race. The oldest known reptilian race in our galaxy. They are, in fact, the only genetic line of their kind that is not extinct. Now, when we talk about that, that's extinct, they have found remnants of others that came after but were extinct. Most of the reptilian civilizations that we know of today, in Butes, Orion, Capella, you know, the ones that are on the list here that I've given you, okay? And I, in fact, will put the slide up so that the folks that buy the video will say, well, what the heck is he talking about? Okay, we'll put that up. Okay? And then we'll move it up. Um, they are all genetic manipulated half-breeds of the original sea car race. Okay? Okay? So, just so that you understand that. They stand 18 to 25 feet tall and weigh up to 2,500 pounds. They're like 
They're like Tyrannosaurus rexes. You know, they're monsters. Up to 2,500 pounds. They have black, leathery brown scaled bellies. They have multiple abdomens. They have whiskers along their chin and jawline. They had a mating claw and multiple tongues. I'm going to give you some very specific information. A mating claw. <laughs> honey, honey, <laughs> Robin, you need a mating claw. <laughs> well, we'll find somebody that's got a mating claw. <laughs> and multiple tongues. Okay? They lay eggs. And what is called a battle hormone is used to accelerate the birthing process. Uh huh. Yes, they are. They are a duality. This is why ancestral females did not participate in war. It's because if they did, there wouldn't be anybody there to help with the eggs. Okay. Um, they also have to be there to secrete this hormone. Okay. I'm, I'm only sharing with you what I know about them, okay? I'm sure there's a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. Um, did not participate in war. Stronger young females were expected to defeat and kill older and weaker leaders in ritual combat. The sea car race is ruled and managed by genetic lines, genetic lineage. And genetic lineage always follows the mother. Because you always know who the mother is. Mm -hmm. You don't always know who the father is. OK? So you know, in that particular line, the gals have all the same. Ruled by a monarchy of a queen genetic lineage, they are one of the most powerful races in the galaxy. They have some of the greatest military might that has ever been seen in the galaxy. And most of the clan members are zealots and will do anything for the glory of their clans, of their lineage. They have been the chief enemy of all human races in this galaxy in past conflicts. Again, we're talking about hydrogen. Hydrogen breathers versus oxygen breathers. They have three spinal columns. One spine is located ventrally near the stomach. The other two are located dorsally on the left and on the right of the sea car's body. The spinal columns join near the dorsal of the geometric center at the extreme posterior of the trunk to form a long and very powerful tail. Inside of the hands or claws of the sea car are jelly-like sacs that excrete various hormones and substances when the sea car is aroused, either for sex or for battle. The primary purpose of these enzymes is to initiate encrusting of sperm. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, you know, hey, you know, the, you know, there is just, there is an amazing amount of life out there. And, uh, you know, they, they look at us and they, they, think, they think we're beasts as well, honestly. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I'm going to talk about the Lyrans. Now, when I'm talking about the Lyrans, and then I'm going to talk about the human race as a whole, ab about some other things here. I, I've, I've got some pretty good notes. Um, I'm also talking about us, okay, and our ancestors, and all the ancestors 
of the ancient Lyran line, genetic line. Okay, now before I even get to that, I'm just going to read, I'm going to read the first sentence that I have on humans. The human race is unusual in having all of its members' race derive from one genetic line. Okay, that's, that's an amazing thing. That is an amazing thing. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about the Lyrans and then we'll talk about humans some more. Okay, um, okay, we'll talk about the Lyrans. Their skin color is amber, blue, and or red. The color of the stars in their planetary systems is what caused their skin, skin tint to change. Okay, depending upon the frequency and the UV ultraviolet scale of their stars. Okay. Um, they're mammalian of mammal mammalian descent. Okay. Um, they are the only they are the only human race to have full empathy senses and full sonic, bisonic abilities and have experienced quantum probability control. I'm still working on that. Okay? Well, you got to understand these are extraterrestrials who know what this all means, okay? I, <laughs> okay, I'll read it again. They were the only human beings to have full empathy sense Full Pisonic abilities, P S I O N I C, and have experienced quantum probability control. Okay. They are also considered today a retired race that has very little intercourse with other main civilizations. In the past, on Earth, <clears throat> they were known That's what they were known as. Oh, I'm sorry. Bada Savita. It's B O D. B O D H I S A T T V A. Yep. Ta da. <laughs> The lights go off. That's great. You know, that's great. <laughs> okay. They have been known to monitor and provide guidance for some planetary systems. Some planetary systems today see them as their protectors and guides. They're worshipped, in other words. What's interesting is that the Lyrans prefer to live on ringed worlds. They just have a preference for living on ringed worlds. And on the Andromedan Council, they are known as an elder race, which carries great prestige on the Council. Because extraterrestrial civilizations, ladies and gentlemen, um, really pay close attention to genetic lineage. Okay, now we're going to talk about the human race as a whole. The Andromedan, how the Andromedans see the human race. Okay, 
and I'm doing this for the people at home so that they can all write this down. Okay. Some of this will be a little bit familiar because I've touched on it, but we're going to talk about it again. The human race is unusual in having all of its member races derive from one genetic line. This accounts for the remarkable causable interactions, casual interactions, of the great human civilizations. But for better or for worse, human galactic civilizations, even if they compose a single clan, has, have diverse evolutionary histories. Okay? Each culture is very different in the way that they've evolved. Okay? Not as a species, but as a culture. Okay? I want to be specific to that. And misunderstandings and conflicts have occurred. Traditions exist to minimize the likelihood of misunderstandings and to lessen the negative consequences of any miscommunications that might occur. So they put in place, they were sentient enough to know that they needed to put things in place to try to minimize human versus human war. Okay? <clears throat> it, <laughs> well, not on this planet. No, it didn't. You know, and, and I think they're still working on it. Okay? In addition, the behavior of individuals does reflect on the species and the clan. Okay, now this is an Andromedan race, an Andromedan human race, sharing this with us, okay? That individuals, the actions of individuals of those races, does reflect on the entire clan, okay? None are faulted for polite or proper behavior. Informality is always at risk of being misconstrued or miscommunicated. The traditions of human interaction were developed by the ancestors over the ages when an elder race insists that a new civilization observe traditions. Okay, an example. The Andromedans come down, they introduce themselves, they say, okay boys, it's time to go to the show. Okay, it's time to go to the show. What happens? is in the show being the Andromedan Council. We are being asked to be invited to the Andromedan Council. What they will do is they will teach us the tradition, the proper way of introducing yourself, of acting before all these other civilizations. Because you will be misinterpreted if you walk in, hey, oh man, what's happening? You know, it'd be completely misunderstood, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, blood, what's up? <laughs> when a, okay, um, that a young civilization observe traditions. It helps the young races build a culture that will function well in galactic civilization, as well as help guarantee that this young race will become a virtuous and productive member of the galactic commonwealth. That's exactly Moronet's verbiage. I took it word for word. The galactic commonwealth. Okay? It is important that all humans be as polite as possible. This helps both the young and the old cultures because many old are socio-biologically dependent on ritual. They have become so conditioned that this is just the way you do it. And they, their civilizations, their traditions are so deeply embedded that they're not going to change. Okay? We have that same situation here on our planet. We do. And can be psychologically disturbed by informal and rude behavior. But he says, if the occasion calls for it, apologize and then speak only when spoken to. <laughs> Never touch a fellow elder race person unless you are specifically asked to. Now, that leads me to something that I was taught um, 
which I did when I was brought on board and I met other races. And this is what the Andromedans do when they meet another race, okay? Um, and I was taught to teach this to everyone here, which I've done, so I'm going to do it again. When you stand, when you have a contact and you're standing before an extraterrestrial or extraterrestrials, you stand, you know, yourself square, you bow, never taking your eyes off of them, and you say, it is the manner and custom when entering my space that permission be asked. You say it very clearly, because what you are doing is you are declaring your sovereignty and you are declaring your space. All right? Because we are not that well thought of. So it's important to do something like this. You know, you got 10 seconds to make a good first impression. <laughs> it is the manner and custom when entering my space that permission be asked. Yes, well, we would have to. We would have to do it verbally. They would probably respond telepathically. And if we didn't say that? Mm -hmm. There is always the possibility that your space will be violated. Mm. I mean, they would, they would violate them probably. Well, the Greys would. The Dows would, absolutely. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. But nobody knows to do that. You know, and besides, they wouldn't approach you that way. They always steal you out of bed, you know, because they're little friggin' cowards. <laughs> no, I don't have any charge on that. <laughs> okay, okay. Physically disturbed and spoken to. Most human galactic races have three languages, and these difference markers are formal, informal, and differential. Now, the differential apparently is um, what's used in a lot of politics, galactic politics, that particular language. The formal is when you are addressing your own race, um, like uh, State of the Union. It's also when you are talking to elders. If I'm a young person, I'm a young Terran, and I'm addressing an elder of my race, I'm to use the formal, okay? The informal is informal. Yo, blood, what's happening? Okay? <laughs> okay. The informal marker is not used ever in public. Always ask if both parties are comfortable with the informal language. So I would have to say, Mike, do you mind if I talk trash? <laughs> and Mike would have to say, sure, man, talk trash. <laughs> okay? And then we're both agreed, and I can talk trash. <laughs> it's probably a bad example, but, <laughs> okay. The informal marker is always used, uh, the formal marker is always used in public because you always want to regard your partner in conversation as worthy of respect. The prestige of a mature race is always subject to debate. The general rule of respect, the first, I'm sorry, the general rule is a, uh, uh, the first measure of the general rule of prestige is number one, the age of the race. Okay? The age of the race. The second index is the race's lineage. Okay, it all comes back to genetics. The third index is the number and size of the race, or the clan, or the tribe. Okay? In standard introductions, always include identification by full name, species name, and irrelevant titles, and your home planetary system. Which is the clan? Yes, which is the clan. Okay. Name, rank, and... Serial number. <laughs> <laughs> name, rank, um, species name, and planetary system. Did you say Earth, Terra 3? Earth, Terra 3. Or Sol, S-O-L, Terra 3. Because our star is known as Sol. We are Terra, which is third planet. Okay. 
third rock from the sun. Now, if you were in Mars, you would say Sol, Terra 4. Okay. Okay. Okay, we covered that. I'm going to talk about the greys. The Dows. D-O-W is how, is how the Andromedans refer to them. You guys want to take, take a five-minute break? Want to take five minutes? Okay, then we'll come back and we'll continue. Are, are, are you guys enjoying this? Absolutely. Okay, great. I don't like it. Okay, well, you're not getting your money back. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. We're going to take a break. Uh, Joe? Yes. Um, some, some of the genetics, some of the, um, the cast, uh, oh, but the, the bioengineered lower races have been engineered for O2. They, can, they have to come here, they have to be in suits. Or some kind of a vehicle that they can move along the surface. No, if we were able to get them out of their craft, they would die. A few short moments. <laughs> right. uh -huh. well, they were bio, you know, they're geneticists. They were bioengineered to operate within an O2 environment. Right. Uh -huh. But they can't go home. They can't go to their home worlds. Well, you know, they were specifically bred. Yes. Do you know what those two wormholes are? Do they know what they are? Where they are? Yes, they do. In the galaxy? Mm -hmm. Didn't share that with you? No. Exactly where they were? No. Knowing because I would, I would probably talk about it. And the first thing our military would try to do is do something weird, you know, cause, because they don't, they don't always, they're not always sentient beings. <laughs> I like them. Which one you know, you should sell a to this stuff, you know, and huh? money. Yeah, do a Richard Hoagland. Do a Richard Hoagland. <laughs> yeah, I've heard. I've heard. R Richard, Richard, Richard deserves a movie. <laughs> he talks fast enough. He'll promote it all himself and yeah. watch it all. Right. And he'll provide all the. Dialogue. That's okay. That's okay. That's all I think. Yeah, he's got some That's good information. You know, everybody's got pieces of the puzzle. Everybody's valuable. Okay. Now the question was, we're going to talk about the Dows. The Dows are the reticulans, number seven on your list. Okay, let me change this. DOWS, exactly right. Like Dow Chemical Company, that's exactly right. Okay. Okay, for those of you at home watching the video, okay, the Andromedan word for this particular race when tweaked and converted into English is Dows. Okay, they're known as the Dows. Militant race, known to be very hostile to humans. Humans have never been able to successfully negotiate with the Dows. Okay? <laughs> um, I'm sure that our military wished they knew about this in the 50s. <laughs> okay? <laughs> And because, you know, they made agreements, they signed treaties, and the Dows have never kept one of them, but they're so technologically advanced that we're having a hell of a time getting rid of them. Okay? When you say human, you don't mean just on this earth. No. No. Humans. If it was more, if more meant specifically Earth, he would have said Terrans. Okay? But apparently everybody's had a lot of problem with them. Okay? They are known in the inner circles as a pain in the ass. Okay? <laughs> Um, that's informal. <laughs> <laughs> that's informal, yes. I'm sorry I didn't ask for permission to be informal. Consider his family. <laughs> I do, actually. I, I love the small settings. Um, most, most avoid them at all costs. They have little empathy, if any at all, for human races and believe that unworthy species will one day be exterminated. They have participated in all... Wars of enforcement. And I want you to hold that thought, and I want you to write that down. Wars of enforcement. Okay, because we're going to come to that. We're going to come back to that. Um, yes, they are. The the original 
the original ones are. Okay? They are, in fact, hydrogen. He was probably wearing some kind of an apparatus. The, the original, the tall, spindly ones. Yeah. The little ones, you know, the ones that do most of the dirty work, they're, of course, just organic clones. Okay? And they've been, you know, genetically bred to, you know, do the dirty work in O2 atmospheres, biospheres. Okay. They have participated in all the wars of enforcement declared by the reptilian alliances. Now, humans have also had wars of enforcement. Okay? And have been attributed with three accidental extinctions in the last 10,000 years. The, the Daos, yes, have been implicated, or these three accidental extinctions have been attributed to them. Okay? I, I didn't say humans, extinction of humans. I didn't say that. Okay? Let me read it again. They have been the greys, uh, they have participated in all wars of enforcement declared by the reptilian alliances and have been attributed with three accidental extinctions in the last 10,000 years. Didn't say who, okay? So I'm not going to say, yeah, it was humans, because I don't know that. The fact that they extinct a ra ex exterminated a race is enough for me. Okay. They are under investigation for excessive genetic manipulations of at least two races. Your Earth race being one of them. And something else he added as an afterthought is that they do not experience childhood. It's probably why they're all tweaked. <clears throat> okay? They don't experience childhood. Okay. Wars of enforcement. In the human race, a war of enforcement is where someone, whether it's a human race, or a reptilian race, or a hydrogen breather, or an oxygen breather, or a methane breather, or an ammonia breather. If they cross the line and do something so severe, they will literally go to war to enforce a punishment, to enforce something, a restriction. They will do that. What is going to be happening here in, on, in our solar system in the next couple of years is being classified as a war of enforcement. Okay? It's not a police action. They're coming in to kick butt because they've crossed the line. And we're not the only star system. You know, there are 21 other star systems that are having the exact same problem that we're having. This is where you talk about the beginning kicked out. Yes, that they want all regressive presences off our system off our, our planet and the moon. They want them completely out of here. End of story, they want them out of here. Now, if it's true that the moons, and Mar the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, are no longer in orbit around Mars and that they are in fact in orbit around Earth, then <coughs> something really major is about to happen. No, Apparently people do. Apparently people do. People are taking photographs. Um, they are. People are seeing it. I myself haven't, have not, you know. But I live too close to Denver, and I, there's just a lot of city lights. Um, but there are people back east who say they are seeing them, or people in Europe who are seeing them, you know, who said they've seen it. Uh, the... Uh, the, the, the lunar, the solar eclipse in Turkey several years ago. Um, Western, uh, 
West uh, European um, reporters, cameramen, who were taking pictures, got pictures of these two objects. And when they were blown up, they, are ex they look exactly like Phobos and Deimos, uh, following, the, following the moon. Both inhabited? Uh, no. Well, yes, they are. Yes, they are. Well, they're both spacecraft. They're both spacecraft. It's a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. It's an old, hollowed-out planetoid, converted with an ecosphere on the inside and propulsion on the outside. Right, it's a spacecraft. It's an older model. You know, you can find one on any good used spacecraft <laughs> car lot. <laughs> you know, and the Dows. Now, according to Mornay, and this was many years ago before um, their alleged re-entry into our into our uh, our atmosphere or gravitational field. Um, Mornay had said that the last time that Phobos specifically, he didn't mention Deimos, had entered the Earth's atmosphere or gravitational field was when the Great Plague began. Mm -hmm. Was the plague <laughs> intended to be a genetic manipulation? The what? Was the plague? It was. It was. Mm -hmm. um, there are all kinds of paintings and records of spacecraft flying through space. Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, the Gods of Eden, William Bramley. He's got it in his book, right? We talked about that earlier, Robin and I. Um, where, you know, they talk about starships, spacecraft, something flying through space, dropping um, spores. Okay? Weeding out. It's a weeding out. And this is the Dow spacecraft? Yes, the Dow's. Okay, um, I want to cover a couple of the things before I get to some of the other races. Dolphins and whales. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lighten this up a little bit. Dolphins and whales in our galaxy are honored as sentient animals. They are brilliant philosophers and poets. Philosophers and what? Poets. <laughs> okay? And we think they're just big, dumb fish. Well, we know dolphins aren't. We're not sure about whales. Okay? But apparently they're absolutely amazing, amazing mammals. And have the admiration of many of the old races for their beautiful songs and storytelling. They have legendary stories of the whale dream, which is the cetacean race memory. So they tell stories about their lineage, okay, which they call whale dream. If the humans of Earth make extinct these species, they will have no standing in the galaxy. Star Trek. Star Trek. Then this is the only and, you know, some of these guys, some of these writers, they're clued in. I don't know where they're getting this stuff, but they're totally dialed. Okay, and the same for dolphins. You know, we don't know their language. And it's an extremely sophisticated language. It's more sophisticated than the English language. You know? Um, and it's, and it's, apparently it's, it's, a trinary, it's a trinary language, which is why we don't understand it. Because we are so one-dimensional in our language. You know? Is this the only place they are, No, no. Uh, whales and dolphins originated in, originated in Cygnus Alpha. Okay? I got one of those. I'll tell them more about the dolphins. Huh? I'll tell them more about the dolphins. Okay. Okay, now if you look on your little cheat sheet... Lift the lid. Oh, yes, you're right. You gotta, gotta keep an eye on me. Okay, smaller star systems which orbit around the central suns of Deneb, Sadar, Guinea, and Alberia are where they come from. The largest population of whale and dolphin life is right here, okay? Within this collection of smaller stars are thousands 
of star systems. Why were they brought For song. They wanted to migrate. They wanted to explore other worlds. They wanted to add to the, to the, to the whale dream. Okay? And they were brought here millions of years ago, and they are recording. You know? And my understanding is, is that when they birth the young, they teach them the song, okay? And the song is the story of the lineage, of their lineage, and the history that they've learned of the home world that they're on. That's the song that they sing. They're singing the song of the story, of the lineage, okay? And it's, you know, one right after the other. They teach them everything they know. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. Okay. Um, okay, just going to touch on <clears throat> on H2 and O2. Hydrogen, the hydrogen life beings were threatened or felt threatened by O2 life forms because O2 life forms have a much faster rhythm. Hydro, um, hydrogen can only travel at near uh, space light speeds. They cannot go beyond that. Okay? O2s can go much faster as, for, uh, as fast as four times the speed of light. O H2s are much smaller and slower and more numerous because of a higher frequency of suitable biospheres. Okay? We talked about that earlier. These are just some notes, uh, random notes. Um, there is trade between the two, between hydrogen and oxygen breathers. Uh, but very disastrous wars have been fought between these two civilizations in the past. The Andromedan Council. Now, I, I, I want to preface this again, okay? The Andromedan Council is held in the star system of the constellation of Andromeda. And okay, and it's here at Mirosh. Okay, this right here. This is where the Andromedan Council is held. This is also where the star systems of Zenite, all in here, Zenite exist. This is where the Andromedan people live. Okay. These systems right here is where the Andromedan Council is held. Yes, they are. The Andromedan Council was created to study migration and to try to limit contact between hydrogen and O2 races. And hence, to stop conflict between the two great orders of organic life. Communication between the two species at times remains quite difficult. Okay, that's how it got started. Okay. Yes, you should. And you absolutely want to use the formal polite language so that nothing you say is misunderstood. Okay? You will know that because they will be wearing some kind of an apparatus over their, their nostrils. Now those nostrils could be almost anywhere depending upon the species. Okay? If they're wearing a suit or some type of a helmet, then you can assume that it's a hydrogen. Okay? Or a methane or an ammonia. Okay? Because if it's an O2, an oxygen, he will not need that apparatus. Okay, the Andromedans. These are just some brief notes, and then we're going to do some questions, okay? They are tough, honorable, courageous fighters. They build massive ships to environmentally resemble worlds. Comfortable, solid, and durable craft. These are my own words. They are model galactic citizens. They are responsible to a fault. If they tell you they're going to do something, they will do it even at great cost to themselves, okay? 
Um, they are very active in galactic politics and enjoy considerable influence in galactic institutions. Now, institutions have been set up, okay, especially with O2 civilizations. Those civilizations are the institution of civilized warfare, okay, upliftment, you people would know that as ascension, okay, their word is upliftment. They don't use the word ascension, okay, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Migration, which is colonization, and traditions, okay. They are very patient, thoughtful, and above all, careful. They have been responsible for the official stoppage of hostilities in many wars and assisted in the withdrawal of all forces that were in those conflicts. Okay. Upliftment. A lot of people here on Earth in the New Age circles talk about ascension. But, you know, nobody really knows what the ascension is. Okay, they know that, well, what we do know is that there are higher densities and that all of us are striving to reach a higher frequency in the hopes that we will move into a more evolved society, become more evolved ourselves, and become more expanded, expanded consciousnesses. Because sometimes third density is just too damn hard. I acknowledge all that, okay? All of that is correct. Those things do happen. And there is archaeological evidence in the galaxy of races that have actually changed their frequency and moved to a higher level. That's a fact. But it is not called ascension. It's called upliftment. And apparently, none of the races that have done this have done it by themselves. They have always had someone help them out of the mess that they're in. Reach down and basically mentor them to the next level. Does that mean they don't have a body anymore, physical body? No, they have a physical body. There's physicality in all the dimensions. Okay, there it is. You know, you just don't move up to fourth density and fifth density, and now you're just this little cloud blowing with the breeze, and, you know, it's not like that at all. Okay, it's as solid as this. It's just completely different. Okay, the physicality is different. The physicality is much bigger. It's on a much grander scale. Okay, the color spectrum, okay, or the, the, the color spectrum where we live on now is 72 different frequencies of color. Fifth density, it's 123, okay? And I've talked about this before. There are colors and things that I've seen that I can't explain. There's just no way, because there's nothing here to compare it to, okay? <clears throat> okay, I want to do 15 minutes of, of questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Russ. Robin. Okay, I wanted to ask you about the Dogons, you know, and that whole Syrian thing that when the Dogons tribe in Africa said they mm -hmm. used to love the Syrians and all. Right, from Cirrus B, and they had maps before we even knew that Cirrus B came about. So did they have a fish tail? I'm not aware of that. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of that at all. I have an actual fish tail. Mm -hmm. No. Do we Demi. know, you mentioned upliftment, do we know who or if we are helping, being helped with upliftment? I think, I think that that's a possibility. I think that that is an absolute, real, definite possibility. Because Vaseyev said to me once, before he, he crossed over, that our specific Terran race was one of the most promising human species that they had seen in a very long time. Okay? Despite all the other crap, we were one of the most promising. However, and I'm just, I'm, I'm giving you my own um, opinion now, 
based on what I know. I don't know this as fact. But if the Andromedan Council does what they're planning to do next year and try to remove all ex regressive presences, extraterrestrial presences, off the planet and the moon, if they do in fact do that, Morinet has said that they are planning to just sit up in space, we will all see them, and watch us for anywhere from two to four years in our time. And what they want to do is they want to see how we are going to react with each other when we're not being manipulated. Will we in fact come together? Okay. Now the point that I made this morning was there was a period of 300 years where there was absolutely no extraterrestrial intervention. And what happened? We dusted off the monarchies of Europe and we created the United States of America. The United States of America, ladies and gentlemen, was never supposed to happen. It was an accident. It was never supposed to happen. Okay? The royal families of Europe who were connected to the extraterrestrial lineages were never supposed to lose control. Never. And once America opened up Pandora's box, a lot of people followed. You know, because we had all been sick of the, of, of the tyranny. You know, and we still are. Go ahead. Well, to follow up kind of on that, anything you might be willing to say about shape shifting, royalty, recoins, that sort of thing. I had this conversation earlier as well um, with a member of our audience. Um, shape shifters. Does technology exist where someone can create a holograph around themselves? Yes, the technology does exist. Is that technology presently being used on Earth? The answer to that is no. Okay, now, can a person, can a regressive entity take over a human body? The answer to that is absolutely yes. And the process is actually very simple. They abduct someone, they bring him to death very slowly, and the moment his last breath, his essence, leaves the body, they replace it with another. Several m moments later, that person, that, b that body will rise off the table. It'll be the same physical body, but inside it has a completely different agenda because now it's a different soul. That technology does exist. Would you call that a Yes, I would. Would they have the memory of the original body? Yes, they do. But I, my understanding is that there's anywhere from three to seven months where there is a transition period. And generally when it happens to a major figure, they will be out of the limelight or be very rarely seen. Okay, when that happens. Because they're still adjusting. Now, now let's, let's, now let's talk about that some more. The word is, well, or so what some people have said is, well, I saw them, I, I, I saw them turn into a reptilian. I, I actually saw the reptilian. Now, that's probably very true. Now, that doesn't mean that they're, that they're actually a reptilian and they're just, you know, using technology to look like a human being. It's a human body. But you've got to remember something. Reptilians are not used to the extremes of emotions. They don't have emotions like we do. Okay, in fact, many of the human races out there don't have the extreme of emotions that we do. So what happens is, is that if there's a situation where the body gets excited because it's a human body, that's what it does. It's this huge antenna. When it gets excited, the reptilian soul inside doesn't know how to act. Okay, so he probably either gets frightened or he gets alarmed. And when he does that, because they're extremely powerful souls, okay, you see a projection of themselves. You see the projection of themselves in their, their auric field. You will see it, okay, because they're not used to the emotions. They don't know how to handle it. And that's part of the transition period. That's what I've been told. Well, can an original reptilian have sex with a human being? Yeah, but, but no offspring will come of it. 
you know, if there's offspring, it's because there was a genetic manipulation. Why would they do it then? Just I, I actually don't know that it actually has been done, but it can. They do have a phallic. It's a leading phallic. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that comes into play. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've run into that with some people. So I'm a could be. Maybe they just want it. Maybe they're trying to experience. Maybe they've been watching humans do it. They see the heightened emotion and passion and um, the rush that we get at that moment. And maybe they're trying to experience it themselves. Well, they say they are attracted to, you know, orgies and. Well, because of the emotion. Right. Uh -huh. Different races on Earth. Why? Are they different combinations of this 22 or what? Yes, they are. Okay. Yes, they are. Do you know what, what ones are what? I know some of them. I know some of them. Um, but I'm not prepared to talk about that tonight. But we will do it really, really soon. I, I promise within probably four weeks it'll be up on the website. Okay? So that, you know, I'm, 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 I'm extremely motivated to create a scorecard. Okay? Uh, so that everybody knows who everybody is, especially if this thing is coming down. We need to know, or the, at least the information needs to be available. Those who want to know will find it. Alex, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but are, are the Caucasians all from one strain, or are we a mixture? We're a mixture as well. We all are. We're all a Heinz 57 with a moderate to good temperament when we're left alone and not provoked. <laughs> <laughs> Dave? When they remove the regressives, they must be washed from the nine on the empty bed. I hope you don't have a problem with that. <laughs> There's some suggestion how we can take the planet back. Um, it's going to be handed to us. But what we do with it after that will be entirely our responsibility. We, we will be handed back the planet. I, I know for a fact that discussions of a download of all of humanity has, been, is, it has and is being talked about, where everybody is a given exactly the same data of who we are, where we're from, who these beings were, and how we've been manipulated. They're going to basically say, okay, here's the truth. And I don't know how many people are going to be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. If that happens, they've talked about it. Um, I know that there will be some contact of some sort after the extraction occurs. Then they're going to withdraw, and they're going to watch us. Now, if we, we will be totally self-responsible for this, depending upon what it is that we do with each other, and with our own ecosphere, biosphere, um, if we're not responsible, they're not going to help us. That was the galactic debate, wasn't it? Yes, it's exactly the galactic debate. And that's the compromise they came to. You paid attention. I like that, David. I like that. That's exactly right. They don't honor themselves. They don't honor each other. They don't honor their home. What is their value? It's exactly what was presented. The defense was we've That's right. They've been manipulated from the get-go. What if it's a few people that take the responsibility, but not the majority? <sighs> well, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm kind of hoping that they're going to do the download. Okay. Because everybody will then, everybody will know, and all of us will be starting on page one. Okay. You know, everybody. <clears throat> it, it would be a huge help. Did you say this would happen next year? Uh, the date that they gave me was August 12th, 2003. Now, the reason they've given me that date and that specific day, and I didn't know about this till a couple of years ago, why that date, was, remember the Philadelphia experiment? Mm -hmm. when, we, when they sent the Eldridge through time and they ripped a hole, a, fa a hole in time? Well, they created a portal that was never supposed to be there. Some of the regressive races that are here and that have been in other places in the galaxy um, were sucked in through that time hole, and they're literally out of their own time. And the idea is to round them up and literally say, okay, 
we are either going to take care of you here and now, or you're going to be allowed to go back through that hole. Because it opens on that day. Mm -hmm. I believe it's 60 something years. Was it on August the 12th? Oh, yeah, August the 12th. So it's uh -huh. two days. Yep. So when that hole opens, they're going to have the opportunity to go back to their time to where they belong. Okay? And the hope is that they'll do it, and the thought is that they actually will do it. Once that hole closes, there are apparently galactic races that have been recruited from outside our galaxy who know how to fix it. And they're immediately, they're already here, apparently. And as soon as that hole closes, they're going to seal it forever so that it never happens again. It doesn't open again. Because it didn't cause problems just for us. It caused problems for everybody. Everybody. Because it created a bridge between two different times. So what will we experience on that? Day? That's a great question. <laughs> <clears throat> That's a really, really great question. And, and, and Marilyn, I have absolutely no idea. I have absolutely no idea. All I can tell you is that unless I hear otherwise, I will be taking that day off of work. <laughs> <laughs> this has been postponed. I'll go to work. If, it, if I haven't heard any change in the schedule, I will be not going to work that day. It's a sick day. <laughs> apparently, apparently. Now, is there any correlation between this event and the approaching of Planet X? Uh, that's a great question, too. <laughs> Planet X. Two years ago, and I'm on the record as putting this on the website, the Andromeda, uh, the Nibiruan, a portion of the Nibiruan family, the Enki line, approached the Andromedan Council and asked for permission to enter our solar system to retrieve mining equipment, okay, and other materials that they had left behind when they left here. There was a considerable amount of debate. The Andromedan civilization itself was staunchly against it because the Nibiruans are not known for keeping their word. Okay? However, the Andromedan Council itself ruled, okay, we will allow them in. And they are, in fact, coming. Now, what is coming is not a planet. It is, in fact, an intelligently guided planetary planetary sized craft. Okay? It can maneuver, it can change direction, it can come and go anywhere it wants. Alright? It is not in an orbit like we've been taught. Okay? It is not. So that it is a spaceship. Yeah, it it's just a very big one. <clears throat> well it can. It can hurt us. You know, if it comes too close to, if it comes clo too close to us, its field will, in fact, cause a lot of problems here. But at the same time, time, what? Is it as big as they say? Four times as big as Oh, yeah. Sure. Sure. Oh, yeah. There are, there are motherships. The Andromedans have told me of, of races that have mother craft from the Andromedan galaxy that are twice the size of Jupiter, that has over a billion beings on it. That's amazing. I can't imagine being stuck with the same people. <laughs> uh, well, let, me, let me just finish with the Nibiru thing, okay? Um, so they're coming. What's going to happen? I have no idea. I can honestly tell you this, though. The Andromedans expect them to not keep their word, to just do, um, to just pick up their mining materials, okay? Much of that mining materials are in, are in the rings of Saturn for the record, okay? And Mikey, I know, will address that issue because he's got some information he wants to share from, from his own sources, okay? Um, so another question, a couple more questions, and then we're going to stop. It's entirely up to you, Mike. It's, it's your gig. You said the removal of all regressives. Regressives. Hybrids, et yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's, let's talk. That's a great, you, you made me think of something that I hadn't th put in there. Okay, now exactly what is a regressive? How do they know who is a regressive extraterrestrial or hybrid? Okay. 
The Andromedans monitor, monitor when they start and they come in, send in their teams to start studying a planet, a race, for induction, for mentoring. What they do is they monitor their chains of thoughts. Okay? And it is by their chains of thoughts that they can tell who's evolved, who's regressive, who's benevolent, who's empathetic, etc., 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 by the chains of thoughts. They have technology that literally, it's not like a, it's more than just a, a picture of a brainwave. Okay? It's like a photocopier. Okay? It literally, you take a brainwave and creates a picture of an intent and of a thought. And if they see a chain of thought that's very re regressive, they're marked. And they know exactly. They know exactly where they are and who they are on this planet. They know exactly. You know, and they're not the only ones. There are other, other races that are part of the council. You know, there's 38 different races in our solar system and just outside of it right now. Okay? And they're all sharing data. And they're just waiting to find out what's going to happen here, well, to get to go. Would the regressives include humans who are aggressive too? Yes. Yes, it would. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So it's not anything to do with your percentage reptilian or anything else. It's a lot of other things. Like, it's a lot of other things. Like Hitler would be but considered a, a regressive. He would be considered aggressive, but mm -hmm. is he a walk-in? If he's not a walk-in, he stays. Uh -huh. We'll have to deal with him. Uh -huh. If he's a walk-in, uh -huh. he's out of here. Okay, because he's not the soul. Okay. He is not the birth soul. Okay. Okay, are we all clear on that? Yeah. What's that? Um, many of them are walk-ins. You know? Many of them are walk-ins. Yeah. There is one family, and I've been told not to say, because it would get me in a lot of trouble, but I'm going to tell you the circumstances. There is one family where... The children are birthed of a, of a line, okay, and when the child reaches three years of age, the exchange takes place. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> this same family, okay, is, is basically used as a carrier. They are not the actual genetic lineage but they have been propped up to be the genetic lineage. Do you follow what I'm saying? Okay. So they're not the actual lineage, but they've been assumed They've been propped up to be the actual lineage because those, that's, the, that's the lineage that this particular race has chosen to walk into. Breeding purposes. Thank you. I just didn't want to come right out and say that. It <laughs> gives me the, the creeps. Some of the uh, Illuminati will be reading and some will not be removed. Um, the walk ins will be removed. The actual alien genetics beings will be removed. If they are, in fact, true Terrans and they're just sons of bitches, they're, we're stuck with them. Okay? Because that's our race. The fact that they have a mental psychosis is not, is not a problem that the extraterrestrials, that the Andromeda Council wants to deal with. You know, we need to deal with that. We need to take responsibility for our own race, okay? And again, it goes back to the traditions, okay? The actions of an individual are a reflection on the clan and the species, okay? And that's what they live by. <laughs> You know, and there's going to be a big curve, learning curve for us, big, if this all goes down the way it might go down. I honestly don't know, you know. Yes, Sandy. Have they already okay, my got couple people minutes. marked? I mean, some way that they've got them. Are they already studying the regressives from the ones that are going to stay? Is there going to be some sort of a, a mark on people? Yes, it has. And it's already taking place? Yes. Okay. It hasn't already taken place. But they they know exactly who okay. is leaving, and they know exactly where they are. But there isn't a mark that somehow. Uh, like what kind of a mark? They don't need a mark or okay. anything like that. They got the brain waves. Yeah, okay. They've got their changed thoughts. Okay. They what they do is they plug it in. They have their own type of satellite machinery. Okay. And they plug in this brain wave frequency, and their computers, which are incredible, 
monitor every move they make and they're recording every thought and every action that they make and they will answer for it they will absolutely answer for it Alex, would you think that two more questions and then I'm gonna retire think that those that are in this room and other rooms similar that you're talking to that the reason for it is being that we will be there to possibly help with the transition because I would think so I would think so absolutely would think so right this is what right. he's telling us what we need to learn how to stay no, when we find out about, when we're given all of the downloaded information, is doing. People are not going to know how to process it. I mean, like you're, you're you know, like, like your devout uh, Jewish people, your devout Christians, they're going to have a really hard time transitioning with this information. Okay? Because all of their belief systems are going to implode, you know, big time, you know? And they're going to need to, to process this, you know. And it's going to be one hell of a interesting experience for all of us. Yeah. Oh, it'll be gone. It'll be gone in a heartbeat. I've been told that. I've been told that. You know, but fortunately, my wife and my children don't think so, and that's really all that matters. You know. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, they're they're going to see they're going to see rip they're going to see extraterrestrials. They're going to see very large spacecraft. They're going to see hundreds and hundreds of miles, maybe thousands of miles worth of motherships in the sky. You know, um, and <laughs> I mean, are they going to look at me and say, I don't really see that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, and and then then who's in denial here? <laughs> Okay, um, that's why, and, and I think that th there is a move to really educate people, and I think that there are elements within world government that, that are benevolent, that are really trying to solve a very difficult problem, that are trying to help, and I think that's why the Disclosure Project has been allowed to get off the ground. Because for those of us who have been studying this information, that's the smoking gun, you know? And, and you know, that whole thing, is, it's about the speakers. It's about the guys telling their stories. It's not about Stephen Greer. Right. All right? And I want to make that crystal clear. I think Stephen's done everybody a great service, but it's not about him. It's about the guys on the tape that are putting it on the line. It's my bride. Because Baby even, fell asleep. Even people like us here, it's almost mind-boggling. Yeah, it is. So the enormity of the whole situation. My wife and I talk about this stuff. Um, at dinner, we've had Mike over to the house several times, and you know we talk about it. And it, it, the frustration for us is, well, you know, how do we get this information out there? You know, it's hard. It, it's hard, and and all I can do is offer it. Um, you know, I, I can't make a living at this. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, one more question, and then Mike, Dara. Um, because we're here, we believe that we taken the initiative, would it be possible that the Andromedans may want to also include us as like spokespeople for the lay people that they would assist in contacting us or are they going to take a stance and, and not in our face at all? With no. Um, <laughs> I've been talking to them for 15 years about adding more people to the list. <laughs> uh, no, that my understanding is is that many people in the next several years are going to be contacted but depending upon the lineage the extraterrestrial lineage that is dominant in your physicality it will be that clan or that star system race that will will contact you that's how it's done it's all about the lineage out there and it is here it really is okay ladies and gentlemen this has been such a pleasure for me you know to get a lot of this off my chest and my head and maybe the hair will grow back now <laughs> I just want to say thank you you're in for a real treat as well because mr. Mike Rust has a lot of information he's extremely enthusiastic and um, have your Kleenex and tomatoes ready <laughs> Mike, you want him to take a one-minute break? Yeah, or? Yeah.
Okay. I'm going to write some stuff down. So at uh, 12.02 noon on August 12th. I don't have a something. date. I don't have a date. I don't have a time, I mean. I'm joking. <laughs> I know you are. But, you know, some people would say, like, take that serious. Eh? No. No. <laughs> if, if I get more information. It'll okay. be on your website. It'll be on the website. Okay. It'll be posted immediately. So you said this morning that the start of Jehedrin is imprisoning us. Why would we ingest that? That's the energy around the planet. Okay, the, 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 the clustered water and un... Uh, what's it? It's clustered and unclustered? There's, well, there's it's clustered and then that which comes through the... I can't remember. Through. Yeah, anything that goes through pipes and stuff like that, it's a, it, it un, unstructured. There's structured water, which has this in it, and they've, they've proven it. You can put it underneath the microscope and you see it. It's just alive. And that's good for you. And that's good for you. Really? And that is good for you? Yeah. No, because we are in this existence. Yes. Okay. Not, maybe not this second, but... So we are in this existence, so we need this scenario going. But don't but, we want to morph to the... Yeah, you know, it will go. There now, there's, a, there's this thing called SAC, S-A-C. Solar Activation Cycle. And according to this, Voyagers 1 and 2, and here's the phone number to order the books from Granite Pub Publishing. Say it out loud for the tape. It's Granite pu uh, Publishing. Order 1-800-366-0264. Uh, uh, and you can order the books. It's $27 for the big one and 16 for the small one. It's the best books that I've ever got my hands into. Oh, no, now, right. and, and where are we here now? Uh, I just made that connection when he was talking about Yeah. Camera. The, the, this is is something that we are in now, so we need this structure. And now, if that's why they said some of the angelic beings here teaching us the Merkaba field are being taught wrong about what this what we should do with this. But we still need the energy pattern. And in that book, they tell you what the speeds are and what's, what speeds. It's the white at, at 33 and a third this way, and, and the blue th 33 and one third this way or something. It's in the book. But they also say in the book, don't do it. And as long as we're talking about that, they give you this Maharic uh, shield. Here, and I've got the picture. Let's see if it comes up on the thing. As long as we're... I'll just go with the flow. Can you get this at all? I don't know. You, can you get that at all? Okay, well, it's called the Maharic field, and it's a, it's a tube that we can put over our bodies, and they tell you how to do it, and they said you just got to do it every day before you go to bed, and in 16 days, or, no, six weeks, that's what it was. It was six Oops. weeks, you'll be completely protected. But do not get into the... Uh, Merkaba field being taught because they're being taught wrong. They said that it's the DNA, the, 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 the regressive aliens, the intruders, are uh, teaching us to download our DNA into Mother Earth where the halls of the Mente are and the Ark of the Covenant is, is, are and because it's back on the planet. It's inside the planet and they're going to use our DNA against us. So you do not want to fire this thing as being taught. Because Thoth was Anunnaki, right? What did you say? Thoth was Anunnaki. He was showing us, uh, the spelling of the pillar you showed us in the book. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you do that on the overhead? Or? Uh, here. I just lost the page. Had the, the piece of paper. Oh, yeah, I did. It. Here it is. Here. Coming up, gang, coming up. It's the, uh, it's personal and planetary, uh, M-A-H, A-R-I-C, and then shield, they call it a shield, shield, E-D-S, and it's a chart. And they say, for right now, because of what's happening with the white t-shirt and the black t-shirt, don't get into this and go get into this shield system. And it's a tube, evidently, and I'm wired up here. It's a, it's, a, it's a shield that protects you and gives you your right to be you. 